Welcome back. We're going to wrap up chapter 12 and talk about the spinal cord, which is, again, composed of gray matter and white matter. We'll notice that the composition is uh, slightly different than it is in the brain, uh, but it is gray matter and white matter nonetheless. Gray matter being cell bodies, neurons, but mostly interneurons, which is also uh, why it gets the name reflex center. Uh, we'll learn more about reflexes in chapter 13, uh, but those interneurons uh, play an important role in the central nervous system um, by not by, by being able to um, perform independently of the brain. Um, so we're actually going to see that in reflexes in general uh, when we talk about the peripheral nervous system in chapter 13. Um, but for now, let's just call the gray matter in the spinal cord um, part of the reflex center and the white matter of the spinal cord, the conduction pathway, which makes sense intuitive, right? This is a um, these are myelinated axons. This is a pathway for conduction both to and from the brain, right? The spinal cord extends from the, um, again, again, it's continuous with the medulla oblongata, right? Uh, part of the brain stem. Um, but as it travels inferiorly from the brain, it's going to travel through the foramen magnum in the occipital bone of the skull, at which point we call it the spinal cord and it travels all the way down to technically the L1 vertebra, okay? So the first lumbar vertebra. Um, these are actually nerves that continue to travel down from the end of the spinal cord, the technical end of the spinal cord. All right, so your spinal cord, of course, is going to have both sensory and motor input. So this is a, it's a two-way street, right? So you have information that's traveling up the spinal cord and information that's traveling down the spinal cord um, to the body. You've got a couple of enlargements in the spinal cord, which you may have noticed when we looked at the slides last Thursday. The, um, there's, you may have gotten a slide with a portion of the cervical, um, region of the spinal cord that looks very large compared to even the thoracic region of the spinal cord. And then again, the lumbar uh, region of the spinal cord is very, very large, right? It's very thick. These enlargements, both at the cervical, at this cervical region right here, and down here at the lumbar region, are because you have a large number of um, neuron cell bodies, a large volume of gray matter here, um, related to nerves needing to feed the limbs. Okay, so the cervical enlargement uh, is there because of the need for lots and lots of nerves to um, control your arms. And the lumbar enlargement is there because you need lots and lots of nerves to control your legs, right? So you have increased gray matter, increased cell bodies um, in those regions because they need to produce more axons uh, in order to talk to your arms and legs, respectively, right? All right, the conus medullaris is the anatomical technical term for the very tip end of your spinal cord here near the L1 vertebra. And so you can see it a little bit more clearly right here and how the, uh, the nerve branches coming off of that continue down um, into the, um, the coccyx coccyx region all the way down there. Um, you'll also notice that up here, the, um, the nerves that branch off from the spinal cord into the peripheral nervous system um, are pretty well aligned with the vertebrae, right? So each branch goes uh, in between each vertebra all the way from the cervical region through the thoracic region. But then as you get down into the lumbar region, you um, are going to see these nerve fibers needing to um, travel farther before passing through the spinal column through the vertebrae. Um, that has to do with differences in uh, development speed, the rate of development um, of the um, spinal cord and the vertebral column. So basically the spinal cord is like having to catch up basically. Uh, but the spinal cord technically ends right here at the conus medullaris. The um, meninges, the, the spinal meninges that we mentioned are continuous with the brain, the cranial meninges. Um, those connective tissue membranes that enclose the central nervous system, those actually 
um, extend past the end of the spinal cord into this weird fibrous tail, which actually helps to stabilize the spine within the uh, vertebral column. That structure is called the uh, phylum terminal, and um, it's in green here, okay? But that's basically, it's not nerve tissue, it's connective tissue. It's the actual connective tissue of the meninges, the spinal meninges that kind of continues past the end of the spinal cord into a, um, a strange fibrous tail there that just kind of helps with stability. Kind of bizarre, right? All right, so let's get oriented with the spinal cord. We looked at a lot of slides of sections of the spinal cord, but um, without a whole lot of context about maybe what we're looking at in terms of its orientation in the human body. So the, um, if you take a look at this vertebra, right? This is a cervical vertebra. You may recognize it by its bifid process here and it's um, two uh, foramina. It's got these lateral foramina here. The spinal cord is going to travel down that central uh, vertebral foramen, foramen, right? Foramen. Therefore, the spinal cord um, always has a side that is dorsal, right? Or posterior and a side that is ventral or anterior, right? So this would be the anterior side because that is the spine of the vertebra, which is the part that you can actually feel from the outside, right? So this is the back and this is the front. Um, the spinal cord is dorsoventrally flattened. So it's more of an oval shape from front to back. And you will notice that the gray and white matter gives this pattern of um, kind of a butterfly shape or an H shape, um, which is what um, is interesting about the difference between the, um, where the white and the gray matter is in the brain versus the spinal cord. In the brain, remember the cerebral cortex, which is the outermost part of the cerebrum, that's all gray matter and the white matter is on the inside. Whereas in the spinal cord, the white matter is on the outside and the gray matter is on the inside, right? So the gray matter is where the cell bodies and the dendrites are and the white matter is where the axons are. So that's where the axons are leaving the body in a sensory or, um, sorry, in a motor or efferent direction, right? Um, and also where axons from your sensory organs are reaching into the central nervous system to communicate with the interneurons of the gray matter to send information in an afferent direction to the brain, right? So we have words for some of these structures here. <laughs> You've got your dorsal median sulcus, which is basically just a, this little groove that happens on the dorsal side of the spinal cord. This also helps you if you're looking at a slide of the spinal cord to know which side is anterior versus posterior if you don't see it in the context of the vertebra, right? So the dorsal median sulcus is the little groove here on the dorsal side. It's always on the dorsal side. And this larger groove is called a fissure and it is the ventral median fissure. You may also see them called the, um, the posterior median sulcus and the um, anterior median fissure, but dorsal and ventral are more common. Okay, and then lastly, in the very center, of course, you have your central canal, which again is continuous with the ventricles of the brain and is full of cerebrospinal fluid, right? Okay, you've got your, you've got some ganglia here. So again, remember, in the central nervous system, regions where you have lots of cell bodies, um, uh, bound together or, or kind of like grouped together, you call it a nucleus, but in the peripheral nervous system, we can call it a, a ganglion, right? The first of these ganglia that we are going to encounter in our exploration of the nervous system is going to be these dorsal root ganglia, which are uh, located just outside of the central nervous system, okay? So they are um, right before the spinal cord these guys are coming from sensory neurons, right? Because the motor neuron cell bodies are in the gray matter of the spinal cord itself and leaving through here, the neurons and axons of those, the, the neurons that are coming from sensory organs back to the spinal cord 
they basically have to have their cell bodies in these things called ganglia so that their axons can reach into the um, interneurons of the gray matter of the spinal cord, right? So the cell bodies of the motor neurons are here and the cell bodies of the sensory neurons are here, going back in that direction, okay? Um, real quick, let's talk about, again, these meninges. Um, they're not technically, um, they're not cranial meninges now, right? They're spinal meninges, but you still have the same three. These are those connective tissue membranes that cover the, the central nervous system. Again, you still have your dura mater, but it's the spinal dura mater. And again, it is the most durable and the outermost mater or um, connective tissue membrane, if you will, connecting the entire or protecting the entire um, spine. Deep to that, you have the arachnoid mater, which again has this kind of like spider webby fibrous structure to it. And finally, you have your pia mater closest to and um, right up against the spinal cord itself. And the pia mater is also uh, where the blood vessels will pass through to get to the spinal cord, right? Um, your arachnoid mater um, with that fibrous webby structure um, within and on either side of the arachnoid mater, you're going to have more cerebrospinal fluid, which basically acts as a cushion around the spine to keep it from like rattling around, right? In the dura mater. Um, that's the same case for your brain. So the, the um, cerebral meninges or the cranial meninges, that arachnoid mater also has cerebral spinal fluid around it, creating um, kind of this enclosed bath that the brain floats in. Um, and it actually in, uh, decreases the weight of the brain in the same way that like being in a pool, you feel weightless, right? So it actually keeps the brain from collapsing under its own weight. So it kind of makes it light and floaty uh, in that fluid, which is kind of cool. Okay, um, the dura mater is deep to what we call the epidural space. So let's take a look again at this image. The epidural space is outside of the dura mater, right? So it's superficial to the dura mater and it's full of fat. This uh, is named um, at least partially for uh, the region that you will need to go through to get um, to get a, a sample of cerebrospinal fluid from here in the arachnoid mater, which is what you do when you get um, when you do a, a spinal tap, right? Uh, whether or not you're getting a sample of cerebrospinal fluid, or you're doing something like an epidural, where you're injecting something into the cerebrospinal fluid. Um, either way, you want to go between the vertebrae, right, to get to it to get to that. Um, epidural region to get to the arachnoid mater and the cerebral spinal fluid there. All right, so the gray matter has this butterfly shaped uh, shape to it, and it is where the cell bodies, the dendrites, um, glial cells, and very importantly, interneurons live. The white matter um, is going to be your axons, right? Your myelinated axons. That's why it's white, because you've got that myelin sheath surrounding those axons. These are both motor and sensory axons. So remember, for any neuron, the signal is only passing in one direction, right? It's only going from the cell body down to the end of the axon. So you have right next to each other axons that are oriented in one direction, axons that are oriented in the opposite direction. Some are motor, some are sensory, right? Um, in blue, you have your ascending tracts, which are going to be your sensory tracts, right? So these guys, um, their cell bodies may actually be here in those dorsal root ganglia, and the axons are going to come in and travel up the spinal cord in one of these ascending tracts. The descending tracts are going to be motor, right? So those, um, the cell bodies may be all the way up in the cerebral cortex and reaching all the way down here, um, or they may be actually embedded in the gray matter of the spinal cord itself and then reaching down or straight out through one of these other nerve fibers, okay? Um, the columns, the commission, um, don't worry about these individually. I just want you to know specifically that you've got sensory, uh, axons in the white matter traveling up the spinal cord and motor neurons, uh, the axons of motor neurons in the white matter going down the spinal cord. 
and the gray matter in the middle making the butterfly is interneurons, which are basically places for those signals to be passed to the spinal cord and just kind of handed off there instead of like having to travel all the way up the brain. It can happen either way, any way. Um, again, this is a gross oversimplification, right? Okay, some things that can happen to the spinal cord. We'll talk a little bit about some spinal cord, common uh, traumatic injuries of spinal cords. Um, generally speaking, if you have a loss of sensation um, anywhere down the body, uh, paresthesia is the terminology for that. Paralysis is loss of motor function, okay? So different things. Paresthesia is losing sensation. Paralysis is losing control of the muscles there, basically. Um, flaccid paralysis is what we call um, paralysis where the impulse never even reaches the muscles, right? And the spastic paralysis means that the nerve impulses do reach the muscles, but we're unable to control them um, with our brains anymore, right? So reflex action is still possible with spastic paralysis. Poliomyelitis. This is a particular type of, um, of degradation of spinal cord tissue caused by the polio virus. So um, this is why um, children especially that contract polio um, can end up with uh, paralysis in their legs is because poliomyelitis, this inflammation of these motor neurons destroys the ventral horn of the motor neurons or the motor neurons in the ventral horn, which technically is going to be um, here, okay? So basically you have loss of function of the muscles of the legs because you lose those motor neurons. Oh, I forgot that I even had this. So this is a, actually an image from our lab on Thursday. So you can see the gray matter, the white matter, the ventral fissure, the dorsal um, sulcus, and the little central canal there. All these cool things that we were taking a look at on Thursday. All right. And amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, is a progressive neuromuscular disease um, caused by the the um, slow degradation or destruction of the, again, those ventral horn motor neurons and um, fibers of the pyramidal tracts, which are basically just regions of myelinated axons in the brain. But again, mostly concentrated around motor functions, which is why you start to like lose control of voluntary muscle movement and things like that with Lou Gehrig's, yeah. All right, and then lastly, I have for you um, a couple of diagrams kind of just showing the two ascending and descending pathways. So basically, um, ascending pathways are going to be, again, your afferent sensory pathways. This is information coming from sensory organs, like the sensory receptors of your skin, to the brain, going up to the brain, as opposed to descending pathways that are sending motor instructions from the motor the primary motor cortex of the um, of the brain, right, of the um, the cerebral cortex, down to whatever muscle group um, is being activated, right. So you actually have a couple of different, actually many, many more than this, but in this diagram, a couple of different pathways of ascending pathways for sensory information. Um, ones that are for um, body position kind of information, um, touch information, general touch information, nice touch information, as opposed to like pain and temperature um, information um, that will travel along slightly different, still ascending pathways, depending on which kinds of sensory neurons are being stimulated. Slightly different pathways, right? And some of these pathways might be um, different in the way that they reach the brain either directly or indirectly uh, via interneurons. So they might pass the, pass the signal off to an interneuron right here, like this one right here, right? Versus a direct signal that just goes all the way straight to the somatosensory cortex of the, um, of the brain. And the same thing with your motor or descending 
pathways, you have a couple of different ways that that can happen, right? So you've got ones that might actually be um, handed off from the brain to an interneuron somewhere in either the uh, brainstem, um, like this is technically um, in, in the ponds right here, right? And this is a little north of the ponds right here. Um, and then all the way down to the muscle, or you can have a single neuron starting here in the cerebral cortex, its cell body is up here in the cerebral cortex and its entire axon will travel directly all the way from the cerebral cortex down through the brainstem, down the spinal cord to go all the way to the muscle that it's meant to be signaling, which is pretty amazing. So just showing you that there's multiple ways that this can happen, it's, it's not simple. Um, <laughs> neuroanatomy and um, physiology is extremely complex. Again, make sure that you read chapter 12 for all of the important details on this. I'm giving you the information that is absolutely necessary to know, um, but there is a lot more fascinating stuff to be read about in chapter 12. So I highly, highly encourage you to check it out, um, as well as all of our lovely extras in the to-do list, right? So make sure, again, that you do your homework for this week by Friday. You have, again, a homework assignment from um, Pearson's My Lab and Mastering. Uh, and then we also have a kind of a, um, a virtual lab that is required. You need to do this, again, also by Friday. Um, but it's a little bit more fun. This one's a little bit more um, of an interesting, almost a video game kind of formatted virtual lab for you to do on sensory transduction. We will look at some more uh, histology, so slides mostly on Thursday. We may have access to photographs of models, but we don't have enough models for each individual person to get one. So the best we can do is pictures of models, which is like, eh, it's all right, but the slides is where it's really at, right? So we're gonna be looking at our microscopes again on Thursday. And then these are all of your additional resources to help you study. So on top of reading the chapter, right? and watching these lecture videos, which you did, so good job, um, and doing your homework. You can also, and showing up to lab, you can also do these additional exercises just to help you study. So it might be something to do over the weekend, something to do um, to study for your first exams, which are happening next week, right? I will have a study guide posted here by the end of this week. Um, and I'll let you know when I do finally post that. I'll, send, I'll do an announcement on that. But um, your dynamic study modules from my lab and mastering um, are all right here for you. You don't have to hunt them down. This is another interesting virtual lab um, having to do with Alzheimer's disease, um, which is kind of fun. Um, not Alzheimer's disease, but the lab, the virtual lab is kind of fun. This is a very interesting link that I found where it's basically, um, it's virtual anatomy. So it's basically a, a a human body and you can kind of isolate the different body systems. So if you isolate the nervous system, you get kind of a neat view of where everything is at and how it's all interconnected. It was kind of neat. So let's see. So check it out. So you can get, get a sense of um, where all these nerves are going and where they're all coming from, which is kind of nifty. And zoom in a lot, which is pretty cool. So uh, next week we're going to talk about the peripheral nervous system. So basically all the yellow parts. Um, as opposed to all of these um, really nifty um, pink and gray bits that we talked about this week. Anyway, I thought that was pretty, that was pretty cool. And a couple of other virtual labs. Um, or this is actually Dr. Lee's histology. So this is a virtual histology lab. So we've got some slides of some brain tissues, uh, pretty similar to what we had in lab on Thursday. Something for you to explore if you would like to. And he also has an entire section dedicated to neuropathology. So these are all um, examples of different uh, neurological uh, brain and spinal cord diseases as seen under the microscope. So um, very interesting, super fascinating. Definitely check that out if you're interested. And that is all that I have for you today, this week. That is chapter 12, um, and I will see you guys on Thursday. Again, make sure that you have your Rave Guardian app, green check mark ready for me. Um, of course, have your mask as usual. 
um, be prepared to look at slides, bring a notebook and a pencil, bring a sketchbook, bring your camera with a, or your phone with a camera or a camera. Um, and I recommend that you bring your textbook uh, or maybe like a tablet or something a little bit larger so you can open up the e-text and see it and be able to reference it when you're looking at the slides. I noticed that um, we were kind of wanting for a physical text to have in front of us. So if you do have a physical text um, of any kind, I'll bring a couple of what I, what I have here um but yeah anything would be helpful i think to kind of study that stuff but it'll be more of the uh, central nervous system and a little bit more maybe peripheral nerve stuff um slides histology on thursday and i can't wait to see you then for another fun and exciting exploration <laughs> uh in person in lab so wishing you all a lovely week and uh looking forward to seeing you on thursday all right Bye-bye.